Thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us at Dorisville Baptist. Great crowd this morning. Thank you for coming and worshiping with your mom. And moms, thank you for bringing your family in. And speaking of family, we start today with our new family series entitled The Family Toolbox. And much thanks to Lisa Goldish for making our gigantic toolbox there. We appreciate that very much. And over the next weeks, we're going to be looking at different aspects of family, and if you watched the video, you saw those different aspects of family. Uh, uh, the one that stuck out in my mind recently was a, b the bullying situation, the gang situation, broken marriages, um, relationships that are fractured, family finances. So much and so much to deal with in the family situation. And you know, I, I won't give you any details, but you know, I kind of got an opportunity to experience um, uh, this week just a little bit about how the culture and landscape is changing. You know, you don't have to look very far to see that, in America at least, in our culture, the, um, the definition of family and marriage is changing right before our eyes. The, the foundation stones are changing right before um, our eyes. It's, it's dramatic. It's big. And we've got, as believers, we need to know what we're going to do with all of that. And it's really a big deal to God. I, I'm sure I'm taking this scripture like totally out of context, but, but I think it fits. And it's Proverbs 23.10. It says this. Don't move an ancient boundary marker, and don't encroach on the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong, and he will take up their case against you. You know, I think God's word there, in specific context, is saying something. He's saying, you know, don't move those ancient guidelines. Don't move those ancient boulders. And we're in the process of doing that in America. I really appreciate it. If I, and I, this is not a quote, and I may get totally wrong. I, matter of fact, I need to stop and just tell you something. Um, yesterday, I went into labor, and I'm trying to give birth to a kidney stone. And yeah, the pain part's over with, but I just feel like really weird. So if this message is like really good, you can thank God. And it's really bad, you can say, well, he was in labor. Okay, so you got your choice there on, on either one of those. But, you know, one of the uh, Supreme Court justices said, you know, the definition of marriage has stood for millennia. And he's exactly right. You know, one man, one woman. It stood throughout millennia. And then he says, who is the court to take it upon ourselves? The court take it upon ourselves to redefine marriage. And boy, do I agree. He's exactly right. Because marriage is an institution of God. But regardless of that, regardless of that, we are seeing the landscape change right before our very eyes. And, and with that thought in mind, we need an anchor. As we look at family and marriage and all those uh, that it entails, we need an anchor that is strong and sure during those times that we have right now. Now, now I, over the next few weeks, I really, you know, we go to Ephesians, we, we go to 1 Peter, you know, we do the same scriptures. And I really hope to bring some different insights into some scriptures. There is no new truth. I wouldn't want to add. If you add new truth, then you've added something to the Bible, and you don't want to do that. But I really hope to add a different approach and insight. And I really hope to share my heart a little bit uh, over the next few weeks about parenting and those kind of issues. Um, you know, I've been, a, I've been now a uh, dad, husband for 39 years, been a dad for 34 years, and um, been a pastor for 32 years. And, and over those times, I've seen success and failures. And you know, you got to understand that no one's perfect. There's not the perfect dad. There's not the perfect mom. Um, there's not the perfect child, the son or daughter. It's just not. Um, but here's the deal. Over those years, um, as a dad and as a husband, that I've seen a common thread. And that common thread is this. The times when I followed God, and the times when I followed and applied God's word, I was a better husband. I was a much better husband. And the times that, that when I followed God and followed God's word, um, I was a lot better dad. A lot better dad. And that's a common thread. And, and what I want to do, having seen my successes and failures and the years that I've been a husband and the, and the years that I've been a dad, you know, and those years that I've been a pastor for 30, now almost 33 years, and I've seen your successes and I've seen your failures, you know, I, I, I've heard stories that can curl your hair. I want us to enjoy and to experience all that God has for us in the areas of family. I, I want us to... to live within his boundaries. If I had a dream for us as believers, it would be that we would experience all that God has for us in the area 
of families. And, and here's the deal. You know, we all have, how many of all have toolboxes at home? Okay, cool. Now, I brought my toolbox. And you don't have to admit, does that not look like a man toolbox? Did you notice it's not pink or anything? It's a craftsman. It's really good. I will open it just a little bit. I'm afraid it's got those things that pop open. And if I got screws all over, over Jen's uh, piano, she probably wouldn't appreciate that. But anyway, but you know, like, like needle nose pliers. And here, are all, the, all the big man stuff is underneath there. And I got like a tape measure where I can measure things. And I got pencils. I mean, this is, and notice, by the way, that is not a number two. That is a carpenter's pencil. I have gifts you do not know about. I have gifts I don't know about. But anyway, so you know, we have this toolbox. Now, here's the deal. You know, this, this is my go-to place for fix-it and projects. But now listen to this. This is not all my tools, but it is a, a spot to go. If I wanted to work on a car, I don't have very many wrenches in here, okay? But here's what I want you to get. I want you to get that this book, and actually this collection of books called The Word of God, is also a toolbox. Now, it, the Bible doesn't claim to be an expert on everything. I mean, if you want to rebuild a car engine, it may teach you about patience, but it's not going to tell you much about re rebuilding a Ford 302 V8 engine. It's just not going to do that. But, but where the Bible speaks, it is an expert book. It is a book that can be trusted. And again, in the times of my life, when I followed this book, and the times when I followed God, I was just a better dad. I was just a better husband. When we follow and use God's toolbox, amazing things happen. And that's the common thread. I was listening to um, Tony, Dr. Tony Evans. And again, I don't agree with all his theology necessarily, but he is an incredible speaker, just incredible. And I have one message on my iPod by him in particular called Salt and Light. And I was flying over the Atlantic Ocean somewhere going to the Dominican Republic. And, and I saw that and decided to listen to it again. It's just a fabulous message. But what he says is this. He says one day he went into his bedroom and he looked up on the wall and there was a crack in the wall. So he called a painter, because he's not a Mr. Fix-It guy, he called in a painter, and the painter got his spackling compound out and covered the crack up, then painted the crack. Tony, Dr. Tony Evans was happy, the painter was happy, he got paid and he left. And about a month passes, and again the crack shows up along with a couple brothers and sisters. And so Tony Evans calls the painter back and says, hey, you know, I paid you to fix this crack, and the crack is back. And so, and so he comes back, and he puts the spackling back on there, paints it. Dr. Evans is happy. The painter's happy, and he leaves. And about six weeks later, the crack is back, and it's back with a vengeance. It's back with aunts and uncles and, and grandmothers and grandfathers, all these cracks. And so by this time, Dr. Evans says, I'm going to find someone who knows what they're talking about? Because obviously, this painter did not know what he was talking about. So he brings in a brand new guy, and the new guy walks into the bedroom and looks at this, and he goes, I can't help you. And, and Dr. Evans goes, you know, wait a minute, you're a painter? You're, you're a spacular, you're a wall, drywall guy, and you can't help me with cracks? He goes, no, because you don't have a crack problem. And Dr. Evans goes, you're kidding me. I mean, look, I mean, we both can see the fact that there are cracks all over the wall. And the painter said, you don't have a crack problem. You've got a foundation problem. Your foundation is moving, and that's causing the cracks in the walls. Well, so often, I really think we see marriage and family, and we see the cracks and the fractures and what we want to do is we want to throw a little bit of spackling on it and we want to slap some paint on it, a quick fix, a quick band-aid. But we fail to understand is that we're not addressing the foundation issue. We're not going to the toolbox. We're not going to the toolbox and getting the right fix. And again, what I hope to do over the next weeks is to address several issues, several topics. And hopefully, I'm long about the first week in June, I think it is, I've asked David and little Dave to come up and take this time. 
and share about um, how a man measures up, how son and father relationships, successes, and if I can talk them into it, they're failures also. I want us to take an honest, hard look at some issues that we deal with because it's more than just a crack in the wall. Just like I discovered in my own life that those, those cracks, those, those problems I were having that when I wasn't following the Word of God, it wasn't enough just to talk more with Judy or spend more time with the kids. I needed to get into the Word of God and get to the foundation of the issue. Now, today's message is entitled, Family Inside the Box. Now, I think it's, uh, 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 oh dear, I can't remember. See, I told you it's going to be bad. But there's a hamburger chain, that ta- Jack in the Box. It's called Jack in the Box. And we're encouraged to think inside the box. Taco Bell, think inside the box, inside the box, outside the box, outside the box, inside the box, inside the box. Well, I want us to think inside the box. I want us to understand how important it is, as believers, how important it is that when we think, when we do family, when we do parenting, when we do all those things, that we look inside the toolbox that matters, and that's the Word of God. I want us to be bold enough to understand that we need to look inside the box to get the fixes that God has for us. Now, now Paul talks about this. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And it's a wonderful scripture. That's why, you know, David said, hey, bud, I got a scripture I can preach for you. But I really, I've thought about this message all week long because it's such a wonderfully powerful scripture. And I wanted, to, I wanted to teach it to you today because I think there's a lot of truth that we can hear that will get us on the journey of being the families that God wants us to be. Now, you will recognize this scripture. It says something like this. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the first part of that verse says this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, this is really a big statement. And I I was pondering, do we talk about a shame first or we talk about gospel first? And I decided we'd go with gospel first. You know, it's so funny. You know, we Christians do crazy stuff. You know, back in the um, probably the 70s, early 80s, you know, the word gospel means good news. So what we did was, we up to that time, we'd used the word gospel, 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 and then in the 70s somewhere, we picked up good news, good news, good news, good, good news, and now we're back to the, the word gospel, 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 gospel. But the word gospel means good news. So what is the good news of the gospel? And again, some of this might be simplistic. I don't know. It, it may be eye-opening to you. I don't know. But this is so important. Here is why The gospel is good news. In the gospel, in this good news from God, we have how we can have a relationship with God. In it, we find the way that God has provided that we might be declared righteous. And this is all through these two verses. That we might be declared righteous with God. And that's important. Because in that, we establish our relationship. And as we establish the relationship, we have the power and the tools that we need to do life. Amen? To do life. So, so in this, we have the power of the gospel. It begins, our relationship begins with the idea of belief. That we believe that, you know, we sang about this cross today. That Jesus Christ came down, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and then at 33 years old, he willfully dies on a cross because the wages of sin was death. God's word declared it. The wages of sin was death. And Jesus Christ died physically, but he actually became sin for us. Our sin was placed on him, and he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. All all the wrath of God that will eventually be poured out on people who reject his son, Jesus Christ. All all that wrath that's going to be poured out on those who refuse to receive his forgiveness was poured out on Jesus Christ that day. And then in that, all of us can have forgiveness of sins. And you know what I really think is cool about that? Is God didn't choose the really good ones. God didn't say your skin has to be white or it has to be black or it has to be yellow. Or it has to be brown. He did not say that you had to be of a certain intellect. He did not say that you had to speak a certain language. He opened the door wide open and said, whosoever will may come. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So, so we have this relation. In the gospel, we have how God declares us right before him. We become justified before him. That's incredible. But see, it doesn't stop there. That's, would you all agree that's good news? 
But see, here's the deal. Most of you guys, when you trusted Jesus, you know, you figured out who wants to go to hell. So you, you said, I will receive Jesus so I don't have to go to hell. And that's really cool. And that is so true. When we receive Christ, all I've talked about so far, we don't have to go to hell because the price has been paid. But here's the deal. God didn't stop there. See, the gospel is not only good news, it's great news. And the reason it's great news is, is because one, it starts with our relationship with God, but then God doesn't say, good luck, see you in a few years. He walks with us through life. He gives us his Holy Spirit that gives us the power to live a different life. He gives us his word that is filled with knowledge and principles and values that will help us live our lives here. So not only does he bring us into relationship with himself, but he also empowers us to live a different life here. And let me tell you something. I've learned a few things. As you just heard me say, I am not an expert at anything to do in this toolbox. I can, I can do a few things. But you know what? When I want something done well, I go to an expert. And God is the expert on life. And what's so wonderful is, is that in his word, we have all the knowledge of God. Through the Holy Spirit, we have all the power of God to do life well. And I think we miss that. I think we see Jesus Christ as the way to heaven, but we really don't grasp and understand the power of what God does for us here, here. His word was given to us not as a no, no, don't, don't, yes, yes, do book, but as principles to live by, principles to live by, because he loves us so much. And then guess what? Not only is it good news, not only is it great news, it's incredible news. Because what? We're going to die. That's not necessarily good news, is it? But when you die, as you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are going to heaven. And you will live eternity in a place called heaven. Now listen, that is good news, great news, incredible news, no matter how you roll it out there. Listen, it's bigger than church. It's bigger than saying, I'm going to do something good and get up on Sunday morning. It's, it's better than just doing some good habits. This deal is real. This deal is real. I have a relationship with Creator God. That God walks with me, lives in me, and empowers me to live this life here and will ultimately take me to a place that is called heaven. That's pretty good. You know, they always say something like, you know, better than owning a swimming pool is having a friend who has a swimming pool. You know, rather than have a truck, have a friend who has a truck. Well, my best friend created the universe. Your best friend, if you know Jesus Christ, created the universe. How powerful is that? So it seems logical that Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because the gospel is so incredible. And you can imagine that word gospel means to shame or disgrace. To be ashamed of or disgrace. You understand in the context that, that Paul is writing to the church at Rome, Christianity was frowned upon still. Well, that was a two week of a word. It was disdain. It was disdain because the Greeks had all this incredible knowledge and Rome had all this incredible power, knowledge and power, knowledge and power. And they looked upon the simplicity of the gospel with disdain. And Paul said, now watch, 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 watch. Paul said, when I consider the good news of the gospel, when I consider that the message brings me into relationship with holy God, when I consider that the message helps me as I journey through life with this God, and when I consider that when I take my last breath, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, to die is gain because we gain and go to a place called heaven, I don't care what the Greeks say. I don't care what Rome says. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You, as you begin to understand what you have in Christ, if you have any shame, if you have any disgrace, that fades away. I was trying to think if I should say this, and because I'm having a kidney stone, I'll go ahead and say it, because then y'all say, oh, he's having a kidney stone. There are two kinds of people at the pool. There are people who wear shirts. I'm talking about guys. There are people who wear shirts and people who don't. The people who don't look like Ryan Franks. 
Hang on a second. Are you getting the picture? Hurry, get it. You know, lifts cars with one hand. And then there's guys like me. I wear a shirt at the pool because of the Environmental Protection Agency. Come on now. Come on. I'm not exactly proud of my physique, so I cover it up. But here's the deal. Because of what the gospel is, we don't want to hide it. We don't want to cover it up. We want to expose it to the world because it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God for life. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now here's the deal. Now, we may not have the Greeks with their knowledge, and we may not have the Romans with their power, but we've got peer pressure, and we've got what I entitled social bullying. Now, here's the deal. Again, I'm, I'm old enough now to be able to say I remember when, but I do remember when, when this Judeo-Christian value thing was just the norm. I mean, Joe may get drunk on, drunk on Saturday night, but he got up and just went to the church. Family stayed together, not because, necessarily because it was easy or, or he didn't thought it was right. It was just a thing to do for the kids. The, the thought of a same-sex marriage wasn't even on the radar. And, and it was pretty, there wasn't too much social pressure to be ashamed of the gospel. There wasn't social bullying. But have we not seen that change? In our culture, listen to me, in our culture, we have seen Christianities, Christianity looked down upon with total disdain. We are not only God neutral, in many, many circles, we are anti-God. Anti-God. To some degree, it almost seems like our government has become, and this is not a political statement, don't make it one, but the truth is our government almost seems to be anti-God. So, so here's, the, well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. If we're not well equipped, we will give in to bullying. And you've seen this at school. It's a great topic. It's a big topic at school these days. How kids will bully other kids in submission. And the results are always disastrous. And there are people sitting in this room. You feel that social bullying. It's not socially acceptable to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And consequently, we are tempted to hide our gospel. And we're also tempted to do things not God's way, but the world's way. When we raise our kids, when we do marriage, we're tempted to hide it or we're tempted to cave in. Now, here's the deal. If God's way was just a little tiny bit better way, I'd go, whatever. But God has such a better plan. You can't improve on perfection. So don't buy into this bullying thing. I, I've got a couple of scriptures I want to share with you. Um, first one is this. And I've used this before. In Psalm 14, 1, the Bible says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So there's a bunch of folks. Now, they say that the number of atheists in America really is not that large. Maybe 1.5% of the population really believes there is no God. But what we have a, a plethora. <laughs> I'm having a kidney stone. A whole bunch of, a whole bunch of, is we have a lot of practical atheists. They may say with their lips that, yes, there's a God, but in their practice of life, they live as if there is not one. And if, if these people are social bullying you, or if in peer pressure, all your friends do things one way, and God says do it another, you're going to have a real strong propensity or tendency to do it their way. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. That's a foolish way to live life. And yet, as you know, in this culture we're living in, there is a pressure to do things the world's way. Listen to this. This is a great scripture. In Proverbs 13, 20, the one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. Let me say it again. The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, here's how that goes. The believer who chooses to follow the word of God, and may I just back up and say simply this, the believer who chooses to be a true follower of God and the believer who chooses to follow the word of God will become wise. 
But the companion of those who say there is no God will suffer harm. You probably, even if you're 25 years old, even if you're a new parent, even if you've recently been married, you've probably lived long enough to see the disastrous results of what culture tries to do. It's not working, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. Why would you follow something that's not working to give up something that does? Why would you? So here's what I'm I'm asking today. Would you be willing to make a commitment to be like Paul and say, I am not ashamed. I am not going to be socially bullied. I'm not going to cave into peer pressure. If God's word says one thing, I choose that. I don't have to do that. I choose that because it's best and right and it's God's way. Even though it may be going against the current with even your friends. Maybe even some of your Christian friends. Listen to this verse. Actually, these three verses. Some of them are going to sound very familiar. He, Jesus, said to them all, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would be a follower of mine, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It's your deal over my deal. It's identifying with Christ and it's choosing to follow the one who died for you. You know that. You've you've heard that before. For whomever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Now, this is huge. Whoever will will, um, save, whoever will save his life will lose it. If you do, if you cave to the world's way, even if it feels better, it's easier, but you lose your family, is it worth it? If you you follow the world's way because it's easier, because it's more pleasurable, but you lose your wife or your husband, is it worth it? If you lose your marriage, is it worth it? Jesus would say no. In fact, he says this. But whoever loses his life, for my sake, will save it. Even though there may be social pressure, even though there may be social bullying to do otherwise, you will save it. And would you agree with me, we need families to be saved? We need parent-student relationships that are saved? We do. We do. And then Jesus says something. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and his holy angels. Did that grab you? Who is ashamed of me and my words? That when we say, I am ashamed of the gospel because of social bullying, because of peer pressure in this world. And I, I know some of the things the Bible teaches my friends just don't agree with. And if I do that, I'm going to look weird. Jesus says he'll be ashamed of us. You know what that means? I don't either. But it sure sounds scary. I don't know all he means in that. But when I think about Jesus being ashamed of me before the Father, I go, whoa. It may be pricey for my friend to go, you're just a religious fanatic. You're too much of that Jesus stuff. That may be pricey, but it's not as pricey as whatever it means for Jesus to go, I'm going to be ashamed of you before the Father. Would you agree with that? So I'm telling you, there's all these huge benefits When Paul says, I'm just not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, real quickly, real quickly, let me just read this to you. You, oh, you know it. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served before the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, Choose this day 
whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my house, we will use the God filter. We're not going to use the social filter. We're going to use the popularity filter. We're not going to use the materialism filter. As for me and my house, we're going to use the God filter. See, I'm calling you today, whether you're 25 with two kids and they're in diapers, or whether you're in retirement age, I'm calling, no, 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 God's word is calling. Bigger than that, God is calling us to a point of choice, to a point of decision. Follow me. Follow me. Not just for the sake of following. He has a richer life for us here. A fulfilled life here. A purposeful life here. But you won't find that caving to social bullying or peer pressure. You won't. I'm telling you. Talking to a guy who's seen six decades of life. And there's times I caved and times I didn't. And when I caved, life got worse. And when I didn't, it got better. Find some old gray-haired guy or almost said old woman. <laughs> not you, Rita. Wherever you are, Rita, not you. <laughs> Find someone you respect who's been around in a while and say, hey, mom, hey, dad, hey, grandma, hey, grandpa, excuse me, sir, excuse me, ma'am, can I ask you a question? You've been around longer than me. Did life go better when you caved or when you didn't? You know what they're going to tell you if they're believers in Christ? Even if they failed, they're going to tell you life was better when you took the stand. Life was better when you lived life inside the toolbox. It's always better when you follow the expert. I tell you, we've had, we've had a couple projects at our house. We have a bathroom upstairs that we spent several thousand dollars on, a couple thousand dollars on, and I'm telling you, it's horrible. Because we had two guys who were shade tree mechanics. And they said, oh, we can do this. Uh-uh. <laughs> uh -uh. I think I've learned. Money, a higher price, is better than a sloppy job. The higher price is better than the sloppy job of, of social bullying and peer pressure and the world's way. Come on. Gosh, I'm chasing a rabbit and I know I am. Come on. Kids shooting kids. Adults shooting adults. Sexual abuse. Can you think of anything in society that's going correctly socially these days? You want to know why? And by the way, it's a so far it's just a, 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 it's so much a large degree. It's an American deal because America is walking away from God. That's why, and families are walking away from God. That's why. I'm just telling you, listen, I'm just telling you, listen to me, whether you're 25 or whether you're 85, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the answer. That's not a cute saying, it is the truth. Jesus Christ is the answer. So he goes on. In verse 16, the second part. Now this is good. I'm going to say the same thing again a different way, intentionally. Paul says, for it, what is it? It is the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God for salvation. For the gospel is the power of God for salvation. I don't know Greek. Dunamis. Dunamis. It's where we get our word dynamite. It's where we get our word dynamic. Now, obviously, Nobel you know, created dynamite long after the gospel. So Paul's not alluding to dynamite. Nobel took it and used it. The, the Greek word, dunamis, and made it dynamite. The inventor of dynamite. But what we have here, when, when the word of God says the power of God, the dunamis, it's explosive like dynamite. I'm telling you guys, the gospel can blow out those habits you've been trying to get rid of. 
Sir, you've been trying to lick pornography. The dunamis of God can blow out the pornography. You, you, you've been working with a lust deal. The dunamis of God can blow it out. Come on now. Come on. Come on. You, you're sitting there today and you say, I just feel such a failure as a husband. God's power can enable you to be the husband you want to be. Dwayne, our marriage is falling apart. We don't love each other. God's power can bring that love back into that marriage. We have no relationship with our students because you know they're, they're teenagers now. We don't know how to deal with teenagers. God knows how to deal with teenagers. And by the way, teenagers, good news. Can't deal with your parents. God knows how to do that too. The power of God, the dynamic of God. The word dynamic means ever moving, ever changing, ever active. The gospel, this is good, the gospel is not passive. It's active. It's active. Listen to this verse, last verse. Therefore, my beloved, Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in, the, in my absence, Work out, not work for, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God's power is active. God's power is explosive. And listen, that's not, that's not a little train going, I think I can, I think I can. This power lives in you. Let it go. Let it go. Wave that white flag. Remember the old white flag Brent, we had over here you made for me? Wave that white flag of surrender. I prayed this morning. I said, God, I don't know what's going on right now, but I know one thing. If there's ever a time I need you to help, it's now. It's in this message. It's this message. God so wants to release his power in your life. He wants you to be a successful parent. He wants you to be a successful husband. He wants you to be a successful wife. He wants you to be a successful, a successful employee. His power is active and explosive in our lives. Well, Dwayne, wait a minute, wait a minute. It says, for it, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And so that's what we don't get. And this is the time, I'm going to say it a different way for you. See, there was a date in my life, and if you're a follower of Christ, there was a date in your life. And on that date, you were saved. And what that means, as we've already said, was you believed that the death of Jesus Christ was God's atonement for your sin. You believe that when he died, he paid the price for your sin. And if you, if you understood it correctly, then you repented, you turned from your sin, and you chose to follow Jesus. Believe, repent, follow. Believe, repent, follow. Believe, repent, follow. You were saved. But what you don't really understand is you're being saved. If you like a better word, if you're, if you're into bigger words, sanctification. If you like what we talked about before we went on vacation, being conformed to the image of his son. You are being saved. And part of that salvation, that being saved is God working in your life to work inside the box for your family. To help you with your finances. To help you understand. Did you know the book, the Bible is just an incredible financial book. It gets such great wisdom. We're going to talk about that one day. We're going to talk about you know, when, a, when a child is 16 and David, how old are you these days? 42, you know? What do you, what do, you do with that? What do you do with a man who's becoming a man and a man who's already a man and sometimes they do this? What do you do with that? We need, listen, I, on October the 26th, 1975, I needed a savior. I came to the realization that I was really religious but I was stinking lost. I don't care if I was leading music or in a church or not. I don't care if I was singing in a quartet or not. I was stinking lost. And on that morning, I met Jesus. I was saved. But I need a Savior today. I need a Savior who walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. And you do too. You need a Savior who will whisper in your ear about marriage and about parenting and about you know, life. And Jesus is that Savior. You were saved. You're being saved. And ultimately one day you will be saved. And that's heaven. 
That's glorification. And that's coming after the last heartbeat. So the power of God is dynamic. It's ad- come on now, come on, y'all. You're getting quiet. I hope that means you're listening. I'm not bored. The power of the gospel of, of Christ is dynamic. It was, it's active. In, and notice I said it is active in my past. It's active in my present. It'll be active in my future. Now this is too good of a deal to turn away. For, for it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone. I love this, to everyone, to everyone who believes. To the Jew first. And that doesn't mean Jews are more important. It's a chronological thing. To the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And there's only two kinds of people. There's Jews and Gentiles. And the gospel's for every person. And I'm telling you this, listen to me. When we get this right... When when we all of a sudden start saying, okay, God, I need to live life inside the toolbox. People will not notice your religious attempts. But they will notice the power of God working in your marriage. They will notice the power of God working in your parenting. They will notice the power of God working as you walk the, the halls of the high school here in Harrisburg. They will see the power of God 500 feet below ground as God works in your life. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the, verse number 17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. That is God declaring me and you righteous through his son. It's revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, The righteous shall live by faith. And that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. If if we could take a pill and all of a sudden all this would make sense to us, some of us would think that would be easier. But God says we do it by faith. Faith simply says, I believe you, I trust you. I believe you, I trust you. I believe you, I trust you. God, I'm like, you know, Someone here, you know, you're, you're a brand new parent and you got this little baby and the little baby's five weeks old and you lost the instruction manual and you can't take them back to Walmart. You say, you say I want a different one. This one cries all night. Oh, come on, you thought that. Don't leave me on this limb by myself. You thought that. God, how can I be a, how can I take care of this little, you gave me this baby. How would I do with this baby? You trust me by faith. But, but God, this money thing makes no sense to me. Trust me by faith. God, this marriage thing, it's hard. We've been married three weeks and it's hard. Trust me by faith. By faith. Now, look at me. This is a game changer. Now, now oh, what's that thought? Some of y'all are sitting here and you've been saying, I've been going to church for 20 years, 20 It's not like that. That's because you've not tr- worked inside the toolbox. That's why you've not trusted in faith. It's a whole different ballgame. Somehow we equate, I go to church, I get changed. No. You go to church, you may get knowledge. But applying that knowledge through faith is what changes you through the power of God. It's, it's not even funny anymore, but it was funny when the first tip was said. You know, sleeping in a garage don't make you a car. Crawling into a microwave don't make you a donut. Makes a donut good, though. <laughs> Makes a donut good. No. I'm telling you, a lot of what I want to teach you during this series, and frankly, what I've been teaching you last year, God's just shown me. But I thought you'd been preaching 32 years. Yeah. Still learning. Still learning. All right, well, it's time to quit. Let me share one more thing with you. This is the closing. Judy tricked me. Um, I'm not a big reader. And a couple weeks ago, we, well, first of all, then back up, Donnie's class did, a, did the AHA series or the AHA book um, by um, Kyle Eidelman. Um, and he gave me a copy of it for Christmas. And it sat on my thing. It's really nice of him. I really appreciate it. I did really appreciate it. I'm not being funny. But it sat there because I'm not really a big reader. 
And so um, I could tell it was an interesting, it was an easy read, she said, you know, and it sounded intriguing. And so, um, so I took it with me. Actually, I'm sorry, she took it with her. And she finished it and she said, let me read a chapter to you. And she read me the first chapter. And uh, it hooked me. She tricked me. And so I finished the book. And, and it's, I like it because it's, again, I happen to believe that Jesus was the greatest teacher ever to live. And he had this wonderful way of simplistically teaching truth. And Kyle Ottoman has that gift. And it's a wonderful book. I encourage you to get it. And it's really about the prodigal son and being in the far country and how you get home. But he said three things that I really think we can almost apply. Um, you may not be in the far country. I'm not saying that. But discovering and living out the truths of God's word, it probably applies. He said, he said first off, this you, you need to have this sudden awakening, sudden awareness. And of course, in the prodigal son, you know, he, he, he came to himself. So would you be willing today to ask God to make you aware of areas? Because if you're not aware, you probably won't apply. But would you be willing to ask God, God, would you please make me aware of areas when I, where I'm not living inside the box? Would, would you make me aware of areas where I'm parenting, I'm doing marriage, I'm doing finances outside your box, either by peer pressure, either by social bullying, or just because that's the way you've been doing life. God, would you make me aware? And then as he makes you aware, the next thing was brutal honesty. That was a hard one even to read. It's where you finally say, no excuses. Someone in this room is up to your eyeballs in debt, and it's destroying your marriage. You can't even talk to your wife anymore because you're so mad about it. Brutal honesty. Some of you have habits. Someone sitting in this room, someone listening on the radio has a habit. And you, you refuse to be brutally honest about it. And it holds you in bondage. You know, one of the things I always struggled with, I thought as a pastor I had to have all the answers. I'm discovering I don't. And I never will. I thought I had to do my best to be perfect because you demanded and I thought God did too. And I'm not. So maybe someone here today needs to be brutally honest and say, you've made me aware, God, but now I need to be honest with you. Brutally honest. No excuse, God. No excuse. And the last A, the A-H-A, is immediate action. As God reveals it to you and you are honest, take immediate action. Now, how different would life begin to be if you ask God, God, I want to do life inside your box. I want to do life within your word. How different would your life be as God revealed to you those things and you finally were honest? I have a spending problem. I have a lust problem. Brutally honest. And then you decided, and you finally got up and you did action. The prodigal son got up and you finally took action. How different would life be? Now, look at me. God wants so much for you. God wants so much for you. And the counterfeit that Satan offers, and the counterfeit that this world offers is nothing in comparison. Satan has been whispering too long in your ear that God is selfish, that God's withholding, that God doesn't have a better plan. And you need to believe the truth today, that God loves you, that God is for you, and within this wonderful, wonderful toolbox for life are the tools you need to live the life God intended for you here. Now, I don't mean an easy life. Don't you read health and wealth and prosperity. I never, those words never came from my lips. But I'm talking about a purposeful, spirit-filled, incredible life. That's what he wants for you. Would you bow your heads right there? Thank you for your patience this morning. Thank you for listening. What will we do with this today? First off, if you're here and you came with mom or 
you know, you're going to do lunch after. Well, I really want to thank you for coming today. And you heard clearly, at least twice, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news, you can't earn your salvation. You can't earn God's favor. But it is a free gift that he will give you by his amazing grace. That's incredible. You can be in relationship with the creator God of the universe. How awesome is that? My friend Brent's going to be standing down front, and we would love to share you, share with you how that happens. And if not, you'd say, Dwayne, I can't walk out in front of those people. Hey, catch us after church. Call us this week. We would love to share with you that great news. And for those of you who are already Christ followers, are you willing, are you ready to say, I refuse to be socially bullied? I refuse to cave to peer pressure. I choose God. And would you believe him enough for him to awaken you, for you to be honest, and for you to take action? It's going to be a great series. I hope you'll be here every week.